Okay, first up on the agenda this morning, we have S107. We did a good, a good thorough jog through. Um, so Betsy Ann, if you would join us. <laughs> Towards mark up and vote. Good morning. For the record, Betsy Andrews, <coughs> Legislative Council. Uh, yesterday, like you said, Madam Chair, we took a look at some of those potential amendments to S107 <coughs> and strike all. The main thing that you wanted to do was add in the automatic voter registration at voter registration agencies, and then there were a few technical cleanup places, and then you had discussed wanting to add in the constitutional or put in statute the constitutional requirement for the governor to issue a proclamation um, prior to the voters voting on a proposed constitutional amendment. Um, so that was the one change that I made from the draft that you reviewed yesterday. Before I get to that, let's just review again what the Constitution says. Um, so this is our chapter 2, section 72 for amending the Constitution. It provides the two chambers procedural, procedural responsibilities in two bienniums. And then, after it gets to the General Assembly in two bienniums, it then provides that it's the duty of the General Assembly to submit the proposal directly to voters of the state. Um, when it's approved by the voters of the state, it becomes a part of the Constitution. But then this section goes on to say, <coughs> prior to the submission of a proposed amendment to a vote in accordance with this section, public notice of the proposed amendment shall be given by proclamation of the governor. And we discussed yesterday how this current chapter on how we ratify amendments to our constitution only discusses a governor proclamation after. And you can find it on page five of this strike all amendment. Here's the current law language. Um, in, on page 5 at the bottom in 17 BSA 1849. This is talking about a governor proclamation after the vote happens. So this is after the voters have already voted and potentially approved a proposed amendment. It goes to say the governor shall thereupon forthwith issue his or her proclamation attested by the Secretary of State reciting the article amendment and announcing the ratification and adoption of it by the people. Um, and requiring everybody to comply with it. So the chapter, as we discussed yesterday, didn't um, provide in statute that the governor's proclamation by the Constitution is actually supposed to be issued before the vote. It's the purpose of it is to provide public notice of the proposed amendment. So with the understanding that the current law language is pretty plain, <coughs> just saying that the governor issues a proclamation, it doesn't say in what form or how, um, I just use pretty plain language for this potential new amendment here under the first section in the subchapter of this chapter that talks about what happens um, after the vote and how to submit the proposed amendment to the voters of the state. So we actually have a section in this chapter called Constitutional Requirements. And it starts out right now under current law by saying when there's been amendments to the Constitution proposed by the General Assembly and concurred in by the succeeding General Assembly as required by the Constitution. It gets submitted to the people of the state for their ratification and adoption in the manner provided by this chapter. And so here's some potential language for you to consider for the pre-vote um, governor proclamation. I just provided following the concurrence by the succeeding General Assembly, which is referring to subsection A language, but prior to being submitted to the people of the state, the governor shall issue a proclamation providing public notice of the proposed constitutional amendment. Is that too simple or is that enough? It's the 
point across. Yeah. <laughs> I did look, I, did, I Googled uh, last night to see what's been done in the past. And from one of the hits that I got, the governor, governors have been issuing proclamations before the vote, even though this statute didn't exist yet because the Constitution always controls. So governors apparently have been doing this before the vote um, without further instruction on what the, it looks like. The only like. thing that seems odd about it is to, is to call both the pre-notice and the post-notice yeah. yeah. of both proclamations. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that seems a little odd, but um, I don't feel strongly enough about it that I feel like we should change the post notice I just think that putting in statute what the Constitution actually says makes a lot of sense other thoughts committee are we good with this mm -hmm. all right okay so if you want a jog through then thank you that's the one substantive change from the draft we reviewed yesterday so the bill just starts out by amending this chapter on how you ratify the Constitution um, like in other parts of the bill, it uh, changes free men and free women to the gender neutral term voters. Um, and that's the same thing that the Supreme Court did. And just cleaning up language here uh, because, big picture, voters ratify these proposed constitutional amendments at the general election. So a lot of the changes that are going on in here is just cleaning up the chapter. You don't have to talk more about what the process has to look like if you just say it's conducted like a general election because that's where it's happening. Um, so that's what was going on in this first section one. Um, you had changed, you agreed yesterday to change this heading. Um, so it no longer refers to checklist booths and clerks and more generally to conduct of election. That was one of the technical cleanups. And there's that post-vote proclamation um, language with the strike there just being to eliminate reference to magistrates. We only have a very finite number of them now in the family court. We can just refer to them generally as officers. Then the bill moves into reapportionment um, and just a lot of cleanup going on here. Um, getting rid of reference to senators being county officers, which they're not. Um, just mostly more cleanup in regard to reapportionment, more of those, that voter language rather than free men and free women. Uh, here was in section five, the addition of this undue influence section um, because it also used that free man or free woman language that I didn't catch before. Then it gets into voter registration. Um, the first change being in uh, <coughs> section six about uh, DMV providing its, its uh, databases to the Secretary of State's office so they can conduct checklist maintenance activities. And then here in section seven, is that new section about automatic voter registration at voter registration agencies that you reviewed yesterday um, with the change from the bill as introduced being that these designations are limited to agencies or programs within an agency that are already conducting, uh, that are already collecting the documents that are necessary, but also specifically whose secretary, commissioner, or other applicable head of the agency has approved of the designation. So there's a requirement that the head of the voter registration agency has to approve of the agency um, conducting automatic voter registration as part of the benefits that it provides. And also in this language, the secretary of state being able to audit any voter registration agency um, whether they're conducting automatic voter registration or standard voter registration, um, the ability to audit them in case they need to uh, update their procedures to comply with this section, with the Secretary of Administration providing assistance that's necessary. So if you go <coughs> to page 16, 
Yeah, around yeah, line nine, it just seems that all the descriptors are plural and obituary and notice are singular. Ooh. I knew it. I had my mind. Yeah. 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 Awesome. No, I, I saw it. Uh, <laughs> all right. I paid you last night. Uh, <laughs> as you knew you were going to lose. Did I pay you money last night? Yeah, you did. Okay. So it should are read. Even? Thank you. It should read obituaries Sorry, or brother. other Pope like <laughs> notices. No. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Good eye, good eye. I'll make that change. The only other thing that's going on in this section is just breaking up this really long one subsection into other subdivisions. It just goes on for pages. That's why it needed to be broken up. Okay, then the bill gets into political parties and how they get organized with the major thing being to just overall loosen the some of the procedures on party organization. Um, for example, the special notice that's required for town meetings um, is only required would only be required for bigger towns now, towns of five thousand or more in population rather than three thousand, and the ability for them to provide notice of town meetings on an online forum. That specializes in the news of the community. Uh, just some cleanup in how the language is structured. Um, instead of saying manner provided above, you're actually specifying the sections, which is what we try to do in drafting. Um, and another big change that's going on here in this chapter is that instead of town and county committees have to file ha having to file their certification documents with the secretary of state directly they provide them to their state committee and then the state committee provides the secretary of state with information about the town and county committees that are being organized also loosening when county committees have to meet overall loosening. Questions or concerns? Okay. So far, so good. Okay. Great. We got our semicolon that was missing, and also you had agreed to clean up the title of this, uh, 2319, because the section will no longer refer to presidential elections. Then we get in the nominations chapter. Um, one of the things that's going on here is eliminating the, um, the prohibition on voters signing more than one petition or statement of nomination um, than the people running. Um, and also for primary petitions, um, providing explicitly that a single petition shall contain only one office for which a person seeks to be a candidate. And then you agreed yesterday um, to provide the same for independent candidates statements of nomination that they have to provide a statement of nomination for each individual office that they're running for you can't list all offices on one um, there's the elimination of voters um, getting rid of that prohibition on voters not being able to sign more than one petition for the same office um, another thing that's going on in this chapter is that um, if a primary recount results in a tie, the party committee decides. The party committee already decides if it didn't head to a recount, um, but there's a separate recount section later in the bill that indicates if a primary goes to a recount and the recount results in a tie, it goes to a runoff. But this makes clear, this, that other section that's later in the bill that I'll point out, and this language here in 17 BSA 2369, makes clear that even if a primary recount results in a tie, the party committee has to decide. And there, for independent candidates, for their statements of nomination, is where you agreed yesterday to add in 
that the, a single statement of nomination shall contain only one office for which a person seeks to be a candidate, similar to what you provided for primary petitions. Um, this in 2414 is just talking about how long the Secretary of State's office has to keep up the candidate disclosures. Um, they stay up until the next election cycle. Here in section 11 about the election complaint procedure is making clear that this requirement for the Secretary of State to have an election complaint procedure only applies when there is a federal uh, candidate on the ballot um, and that's in accordance with federal law. Then we get into the conduct of elections and more voters changes instead of free men and free women. Then in section 13, in accordance with that U.S. Supreme Court case, Minnesota Voters Alliance v. Mansky from 2018, um, it is amending the language on what sort of political material is allowed in the polling place on the day of an election in accordance with that case, which struck down in Minnesota law as being too restrictive on political speech. Um, this new language reflects that uh, during polling hours, on the day of an election, um, when you go into the polling place, you can't have political materials that display the name of a candidate on the ballot or any organized political party or that demonstrate support or opposition to a question on the ballot. So it's really focusing on what is that, what is that issue on the ballot, what are voters voting on, with the idea being that uh, you limit the restrictions on polling materials to that which voters are voting on because that is part of the influence um, that these materials could have on those voters. Then, okay, let me get into earlier absentee voters. Um, one of the things that's going on here, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of duplicative language. The subchapter is not well organized. So you'll see changes going on in this subchapter for organizational purposes, <coughs> but also one of the things that's going on is injury is added as a basis for the delivery of early voter absentee ballots by Justice of the Peace. Also throughout this subchapter, you're eliminating reference to the type of, a dis of disability that a voter might have that would permit justices to deliver a ballot to that voter. And currently the law says only if you have a physical disability, but there might be other disabilities that a person might have that would make it difficult for the person to get to the polling place. And also electronic delivery of ballots um, being permitted for voters who are ill, injured, or have a disability. So that's kind of big picture stuff what's going on here. Uh, first thing, here's the ability in cases of an emergency, even if it's after the deadline to request an EVAB, early voter absentee ballot, um, the town clerk has the, the discretion to accept a request for an early voter absentee ballot after the current deadline. And that ballot can be mailed, electronically delivered, or delivered by justices of the peace. Just some cleanup here of this section. You'll see there's the injury language, removing reference to physical disabilities, just more generally disabilities. You're getting rid of language, um, calling out people who are residing outside of the US um, or who are imprisoned because those are still Vermont voters regardless. You are, have a separate section on what it means to be a Vermont resident. That still applies. It's not necessary to call out those voters here in this chapter. So you'll see that going on in the chapter. This is uh, more just clean up restructuring of this, uh, these, this chapter to make it easier to read. Well, yeah, again, page 41, you don't have to call out people residing in a state institution. They're still Vermont voters if they meet the resident definition. Uh, here on page 44, line 11, is language saying justice of the peace, when they deliver early voter absentee ballots, they may but are not required to deliver them outside of the town. There's 
more cleanup and restructuring of this chapter. Uh, here's the ability to electronically deliver um, ballots to military or overseas voters. Right now it just says email, but um, I believe the Secretary of State's office testified on uh, how those can be handled electronically through the voter system that they have rather than email. <coughs> uh, here on page 48, starting on line 9, um, this is duplicative language when uh, voters are blind or physically unable to go to the polls. Um, they can be marked by one of the justices who deliver the ballots. That's already addressed elsewhere. It's said twice, and you only need to say it once. Okay, on page 49 is a new section um, about early voting in the town clerk's office and depositing ballots into the vote tabulators. This is largely based, as we've discussed, on the current Brattleboro uh, charter, which already allows for this process, but with the language tweaked a bit. But to refresh, this would allow a BCA to vote, to permit its town's uh, early voters to vote in the town clerk's office um, in the same way that they would vote on election day by actually marking their ballots at the town clerk's office and depositing them into the vote tabulator. Um, they have to do it as nearly as possible to how they would do it um, on election day and the Secretary of State would adopt procedures, not guidance. You discussed that language change yesterday and approved it. Secretary of State would adopt procedures that towns would have to follow if their BCA allows them to do this. So this section goes on to discuss basically security measures about how they have to secure the vote tabulator and the ballot bin so it's not getting uh, messed with in any way and they have to keep track of how many voters are using, uh, are voting and depositing their ballots so that they have that number that should show up in the vote tabulator um, and the vote tabulator should keep tracking that number. And anytime there's no election official around, um, the vote tabulator itself in the ballot box has to be secured in the town clerk's office vault. Um, and there's a requirement at the top of page 50 for the town clerk to maintain the record of the voters who are voting in person. And then on the day of the election, what would happen is that the election officials would transfer the vote tabulator and their sealed ballot boxes to the polling place and they don't get opened until after the close of the polls but when they first turn on the vote tab at the polling place the town clerk would be required to verify that the number of ballots the vote tabulator displays as having been counted matches the number of voters who uh, voted early in the town clerk's office and all the ballots get commingled. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you or Will, but have the clerks weighed in on this and has this been run by them as far as this big change? Yes, at least the VMCPA legislative committee, who is my understanding, makes the rest of the clerk community aware of what's contained in the bill. And their response has been favorable to this? That's my understanding. I, I doubt that anyone can say that every clerk across the state <laughs> 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 well, that's why I'm, I'm wondering, I, I don't know that we have heard from them, so I'm curious to know where they stand. We do. Okay. We are, you might have been. Um, we, well, Carol, Carol came out. Right, so she was speaking And that, and that section was course. in her, uh, right. her uh, testimony, and they were fine with that. Hmm. Okay. I think you, you should know, Rep. LeClaire, that uh, it does take a BCA vote. So, I, yeah, I did see that. So there's still that firewall, but um, it just seems to me that I'm just surprised. We're good. Thank you. Isn't it part of it actually to reduce administrative burden of opening the early voter absentee ballots on election day? Yep. I think that's one of the things that I recall. And maybe one reason town folks well, might like it. See election day just going over to the day before. That's been an area of concern for clerks already. But okay, I've heard clerks say that they are really happy to get 
everything kind of set and lined up and like ready to roll so that on election day they're just concentrating on checking people in as opposed to oh my gosh I've been checking people in all day and now I have to go yeah. process all of the absentee ballots so I suppose it depends on yeah. whether you're a do your homework ahead of time kind of person or uh, well you see we're just rocking you know we have the vote tabulator but you'll have the BCA members that will feed the, yeah. the absentee ballots in over the course of the day um, and we have just a funny tool machine. But, uh, That's right. Marsha and then Nelson? Uh, we had talked about the towns that don't have tabulators, but um, my understanding is that they, they can continue doing the ballots the way they have. Is that true? Is that yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got one town that does the hand count, and then I've got the other that does the tabulator, but the clerk has made it clear because of our office situation, there's no way she could set up the tabulator and do it. So she'll <coughs> continue to do it the way she's doing it. Okay. But, you know, and she, you know, usually a clerk controls the Board of Civil Authority a little bit when it comes to voting like this. <laughs> I would expect that no BCAs will approve it unless the clerk right. says it's in favor of right. 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 All right. So this next section is about defective ballots, and it does change what constitutes a defective ballot. Um, it would a ballot would be considered defective if the identity of the earlier absentee voter cannot be determined or if that earlier absentee voter previously returned a ballot in the same election but it does eliminate um, the language saying that a ballot is defective if the affidavit on the certificate envelope is not completed Then we get to the process of voting and counting votes. Um, one thing that's going on here in section 15 is eliminating this requirement for town clerks to store unused ballots for 90 days after the election and just allowing them to be destroyed after the election, unused ballots. Um, and this is consistent with the state archives record retention policy. Then the bill moves on to recounts. One thing that statute failed to address was a recount threshold for federal office. So just providing that the federal recount threshold is the same as our statewide, county, and senatorial <coughs> offices. Here's that language we discussed earlier about recount ties, specifically saying <coughs> if a recount of a primary election results in a tie, then that other section we already addressed applies, meaning the party committee has to decide it. This language in A2, if a recount of a public question results in a tie, you go to a runoff, that's just being moved up from current law, subsection D, just to put it all, all the ifs up above in subsection A, and maintaining that if a recount of a general election results in a tie, then you move to a runoff election in accordance with the remainder of this section. <coughs> section 18 addresses a logistical issue. This is about um, special elections for vacancies in our congressional offices. Um, it was pointed out that the current law <laughs> language might not work out logistically depending on when the vacancy happens and when the next upcoming election uh, occurs. So this is saying that a special election for a congressional vacancy may be held on the same day as an upcoming general election so long um, as the requirement for ballots to get out 45 days in advance um, can be met. Then we move into local elections. Um, this first section is about local election petitions. Two things going on here. First, eliminating the requirement that a local election petition has to have the candidate's name appear as it does on the voter checklist. For, um, so if they want to use a nickname, for example. And also, similar to what you've done elsewhere in the bill, um, eliminating that prohibition on voters signing more than one petition for the same office, unless there's more than one nomination to be made. So voters can sign as many uh, local office petitions as they want. Then it gets into uh, how 
towns might vote on the town manager form of governance. Um, these changes were requested by the Secretary of State's office, as I understand it, just to clean up the language of this chapter because the language was a bit clunky. So this is just changing the language um, on how the vote, um, the ballot language actually has to appear, for example. <coughs> And then we get into campaign finance reporting dates. Um, what's going on here is a move of the August reporting date. It currently says that uh, campaign finance reports have to be filed on August 15th. Uh, because we've got that earlier primary, this campaign finance reporting date normally happens after the primary. So the suggestion was to move it from August 15 reporting date to August 1 reporting date. And because you would move it to August 1, it made sense to move the July reporting date to July 1 rather than July 15 to uh, keep the time spread out. I have a question on the campaign finance reports. Uh, if I had money left in my campaign fund, left over from my campaign, Am I required to file on March 15th, or was I required to file on March 15th? That might be a better yes. question for Mr. Senning. Yes, you were. Anyone who, who carries money over for a new campaign has to report on all regular reporting deadlines. I, I better get on with that. Mm -hmm. I can help you with it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Mm -hmm. The, the no activity report option is really there was no activity easy, but it wasn't. and it's yes yep. other than maybe the bank taking a couple of dollars for holding the account. Why are you doing that, Warren? Betsy Ann, at, at the top of page 57, uh, that doesn't look like a sentence to me. Shall shall the town name shall the Montpelier adopt or rescind the town manager form of governance at this should be the voters of perhaps shall the voters of or something like that isn't it what it would appear for example shall the city of montpelier yeah. adopt the town mm -hmm. manager form of government yeah i mean it, it, it's just there's something lacking in that sentence I, don't think, I think if you so for town name shall the city of montpelier adopt the town manager form of governance mm -hmm. um, Oh, okay. If you, if you put city of or town yes. of, then that completes it. Okay. Okay. All right. I knew it was small. And then the last section is the effective date section. And there you've changed again um, the effective date for the Secretary of State having to adopt procedures, not guidance or guidelines. Um, has to take place by January 1 so that those procedures are in place um, by the time that early voting by vote tabulator and town clerk's office takes effect on July 1, 2020. Questions for Betsy Ann? So committee, there's one other elections issue that is sort of a timely nature. Um, and you'll recall back in February, we did a jog through of H236, which is amending the membership of the Legislative Apportionment Board to include two independent members of the Legislative Apportionment Board. And um, middle of February, we heard from Tom Little on when we were considering the Senate um, redistricting limitations we heard from him that uh, that he thought it would be um, a good idea to include independent members of the LAB and so before we vote this elections corrections bill out of committee I thought I would just ask if we want to pause and take the time to consider putting that in this bill um, Jim how do we um, classify someone as an independent when we don't have party registration? Right. That's the that's the one issue that we would need to come back to to try to uh, figure out whether we can uh, craft a definition of what eliminates you as 
as an independent because I would assume that, you know, absent designation, pretty much anybody could be considered an independent. Um, and so there are some questions in my mind of whether, whether we'll be able to do that. Um, but I thought it was worth asking if we wanted to just take a moment yeah. to try. I mean, if I may, I mean, I don't personally have any issue. I think everybody should be feel like they're represented, but I do question, I mean, the party members of the reapportionment are, are self-proclaimed party members. Um, so I just worry about um, uh, the classifying of the independent. And I guess from a procedure question, I would have if we didn't include this here and we wanted to take this up next year so that we felt comfortable with that uh, designation, can that not still be done in time for um, when the reapportionment the, board? I don't know when we set that. The legislative apportionment board is appointed when? It's July 1 of next year. So okay. there would be time okay. next session, yeah. um, effective on passage or what have you, if it mm -hmm. made it through. <coughs> Just yeah. thought. So, give some thought to how you would designate somebody as an independent, mm -hmm. or what would be the conditions upon which somebody would not be able to be designated as an independent, and do we have the ability to, to do that? I guess this is another question. All right. So, committee, how are we feeling about this bill as we've now looked through it twice in the last 24 hours? All right. Uh, I would entertain a motion. So <laughs> Representative Betsy Ann. Also, and I would just change it, if you are going to move to approve, I would change it to 2.2. 2 .2 2 .2 because you have to make Thank you, Rep. Colston. Um, we like to be grammatically correct. So yes. I would make those changes on page 16, <coughs> line 9. So Representative Marwicki moves version 2.2 .2 of S107. Any idea if Bob is going to be in the building today at all? Or is he out all day today? Okay. So we won't hold the vote open for him. Any discussion on this? Just a procedural question. If mm -hmm. you wanted to add this on the bill, you don't need to wait to? Um, well, I think I was sensing that since we have time to consider this next, next year, year before okay. the so July 1 all right. appointment of the Legislative Apportionment Board, that we would hold off on that okay. and um, just ask people to mull over in their heads whether there is a clean way to define what an independent is. An independent is a disgruntled <laughs> Republican or disgruntled Democrat. I don't know. How do we? How do we? Uh, how do we know what an independent is and is not? Ready? Uh, go right ahead. <laughs> Gannon. Yes. Kids Miller. Yes. Rowicki. Yes. Leclaire. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner. Yes. Vlasic. Yes. Brownell. Yes. Colston? Yes. Colston? Yes. I'm going to ask Mike to take the lead on this, and um, he may want to tap one or two other individuals in the committee since it's a 60 page bill, or I guess a 59 page bill. <laughs> And I will update the section by section summary. Great. Of your and speaks to So we just need to get Mike a clean copy of the bill after we've made those grammatic changes and if he can drop it off to the clerk's office by the end of the day. Sounds great. I'll set it up to Kevin. Thank you. Great. And you'll forward that to, you'll forward that to Kelly as well so she can put that on the Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you very great. much. Great, thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. What would we do without this? I know. So organized. Nice. I love someone who just whips out a 10 page summary of the bill. 
going to go to sleep. Okay, so uh, we need to take up the uh, City of Montana <coughs> Charter relating to energy efficiency, and that's H547. And so I have Mayor Watson up first. Yes. So thank super. you for being with us. Thank and you. I'm oh, sorry, I'm behind. Did you, you, did I see you had some? I did send along some written uh, comments. Sorry. Oh, no worries. It's all good. Here. Well, hello again. Thank <laughs> you for coming back. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for uh, having me uh, back here again to speak to you about a charter amendment. Uh, so I am delighted to be here to represent uh, the voting public of Montpelier. I also want to point out um, a couple other folks who are here. So we have uh, Paul Markowitz from the Energy Committee in Montpelier, Abby White from Efficiency Vermont, and uh, uh, Richard Fazy, who is um, uh, great. Thank you. <laughs> who's a part of the um, Energy Futures Group. Um, one of the reasons that I um, want to point them out is uh, because Montpelier has a, a great um, robust set of partners um, on on this charter amendment and um, they are, have been really uh, fabulous in helping us um, think through the logistics of, um, of what this could look like for us. So just a little bit of background as to how we got to this point. Um, the city of Montpelier has a net zero energy goal um, for the whole community. We'd like to reach net zero energy by 2050, um, which complements nicely the state's goal of 90% uh, renewable by, by 2050. Um, and as you may be aware, um, neither the city nor the state is on track to meet those targets right now. Um, one of the reasons that we feel that there is, a, uh, that, that that's not making as, as much progress as we would like to see is because there are some market failures actually um, that would appropriately um, push people towards um, making energy efficient decisions. And one of those, um, uh, market failures really is um, something called the split incentive. So we talked a lot about the split incentive um, as a community, um, both at, with the council and um, with the public, uh, as you know, leading up to um, this this vote um, that happened on town meeting day. Uh, so the uh, the split incentive, if you're not familiar, is. Um, uh, a problem where the uh, let's say you have a renter who uh, is paying for heat in their apartment they uh, they don't have any uh, authority or power to do any weatherization work to reduce their bills uh, for heat um, but the landlord or the property owner may not uh, want to make that investment because they because they're not paying the, for the heat they might they may not be able to actually make up any of that investment that they would have made uh, so that's one market failure. Another market failure is uh, in terms of uh, the pricing of houses. Uh, so if someone goes to sell their home, if they have done uh, weatherization work, or let's say they have solar panels on their roof, that may actually not translate into increased value for their home, um, and we see that as um, in in inherently problematic as well. Um, so just like uh, uh, car manufacturers are required to uh, tell you about the gas mileage rating of, a, of, of the car, um, we think it would be right to have standardized um, energy efficiency information about a home so that um, buyers can make the best possible decisions um, for their purchase. So um, those are a couple things that we um, have been talking about as a community. Um, we uh, also just want you to know that with this charter um, amendment, um, uh, to that would allow us to regulate energy efficiency uh, performance and uh, energy disclosure in um, both new and existing homes. Uh, that uh, that is just one piece of a larger picture for us. Uh, we want to be supporting um, any anything that we would be looking to enforce. We want to support that with education, outreach, um, and particularly um, incentives. So I've actually already. I'm already having conversations with VSCCU um, about how we can support um, uh, initiatives in Montpelier. We already have a program with Efficiency Vermont specific to Montpelier. Um, the, the city itself has some revolving loan funds that we're reconfiguring right now to hopefully support this work um, so that uh, in the end, uh, property owners would be uh, financially well supported to make uh, any transitions that they, they need to make. Um, and then, uh, the, uh, the only other, well, actually I have a couple other things to say, I suppose. Um, so 
uh, I just want to also point out that uh, the city of Montpelier already has authority to make these kinds of um, regulations for new construction, for additions or renovations, anything that would um, qualify, or that would uh, require a permit. Um, and so really this is just an extension of the authority that we already have. Um, it seems like a logical um, sort of next step to also um, look at um, how we can be um, addressing this for existing buildings. Um, and then uh, well, I also just want to point out that one of our um, uh, Inspirations for this was an ordinance that Burlington has um, in which uh, anytime a multifamily building is sold, um, that building must meet a certain energy performance uh, standard um, as a part of the sale or at the time of the sale. And uh, that there is a cap on the amount a property owner might be um, required to spend so as to not prevent the sale. Um, and as far as energy labeling goes, we're also you know, looking at um, what cities across the country are doing. Um, one, for example, is Portland, Oregon. Um, so there is precedent for the kinds of ordinances that we are looking to <coughs> do here. Um, and we're excited to, to move forward. So uh, uh, I could, uh, thank you again for uh, um, hearing us. <laughs> as your rep, you know, I will support this. Yeah. But I have. My one concern is for, let's take the case of an elderly couple, possibly on a fixed income. They may have spent 30 years paying the mortgage on their home and then mm -hmm. got more free and clear, but they don't have any extra money. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we force them to spend money that they don't have to make their home more energy efficient? What, what can be done to fix the problem for them. So particularly for someone, uh, for a couple like that, um, we would be looking at an uh, organization perhaps like Capstone, um, who also uh, works with um, low-income Vermonters to do weatherization work, um, so already having conversations with them about how we can partner with them. Um, and I think we would want to uh, absolutely keep that in, you know, th exactly that case in mind as we move forward. It just came to me that one possible solution might be to forgive that requirement for their lifetime, but when, mm -hmm. when they pass and the house is sold, right. uh, to require a new owner. Mm -hmm. in. Yeah, perhaps as a part of that uh, transfer of property or of sale. Um, sorry, I can't really call on people, can I? <laughs> okay. Do you have a, a, another answer to that? I, uh, yeah. Richard Fazy with Energy Futures Group in Heinsburg and a resident of Starsboro. Um, Portland, Oregon has, uh, has implemented a, a similar time of sale requirement for information. There are a number of exemptions that they've built into that uh, for, for certain cases, um, and I think we would, we would look at that as part of Montpelier for people who, uh, uh, who are transferring properties uh, within families or uh, a low-income um, situation. And, and then also, as Anne suggested, the, the, um, uh, there are a number of program resources that are out there. We would make sure to, to line up those resources with people in need. Okay. Good. Okay. As long as they're yep. no, that's a seen great question. and heard <laughs> and, and cared about. Yep. <laughs> Paul, would you like to share something? Just quickly, so just one of the points is that we envision a fairly robust public process in terms of what the specifics would be that would be actually passed. I mean, this is just giving us broad legislative approval. The specifics of what it looks like, point of sale, does it apply to rental properties, what, what applies to you know, um, owner-occupied, you know, those specifics would be addressed through a process we're already talking about, reaching out to the property owners in June and having a discussion. So we look at a robust process to engage, engage the public property owners as well as um, homeowners. Jim? Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, first of all, I believe there was language, but it's the language of the original um, charter proposal that we received here says um, enforcing minimum energy standards. It doesn't say anything about regulating, which, uh, um, <clears throat> so enforcing to me means what's on the books, uh, but regulating means coming up with new ordinances. So how, how do we reconcile what was proposed to us in the original charter? Yep, so our, the way that we had talked about it as a council and um, with the community um, really was more in line with the uh, regulate uh, sort of language. 
uh, are uh, uh, we did have um, a, a original reference to um, you know state and local um, uh, um, sets of standards, um, which is to say that you know we want to use uh, you know the kinds of standards that already exist. Um, but because uh, there are no standards for existing buildings, we would have to um, have some kind of, uh, we'd have to create um, some standards there. So this, this language that um, is before you now is actually more in line with the intent um, of the way the council uh, was talking about it. Okay, in intent in your mind and in my mind might mm -hmm. be two different things. Fair. Um, what what was the charter presented to the voters when they actually voted on it? What was the wording? Um, it was in, um, able to enact ordinances to enforce. Okay, so we're taking a leap of not, uh, you know, approving something that was not what was before the voters. So just FYI, we've had another charter that has a perhaps similar um, issue. Larger. Larger issue. I, I'll, I'll grant Multifaceted. that. Multifaceted. Okay. Um, secondly, um, um, when we enact state, federal, whatever energy standards, you mentioned cars. Um, it typically goes on new cars going forward. Um, we don't typically go backwards and say. By the way, your cafe standards need to be on your ten-year-old Dodge. Need to be X, right? Mm -hmm. um, what you're proposing here in the revised wording uh, or intent is to go back and say, well, yeah, you do have to change the mm -hmm. gas right. standard yeah. of that ten-year-old Dodge. Yes. Um, when we do plumbing standards, we might say, you know, you got to have low-flow toilet fixtures, um, and uh, we don't tell people that, by the way, this is the standard, you better, you know, change all your plumbing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I appreciate that you'll go through a, as Paul mentioned, a robust public process, but um, we're really opening this pretty wide, um, you know, wide enough that I'm not sure the legislature would go back and make people change their plumbing uh, fixtures in their house. Um, so, um, I just... May I respond? Um, so, I would point out that one major difference there is that cars end up off the roads um, in approximately 10 years, whereas buildings do not typically do that. Mm -hmm. And Montpelier is pretty well built out. So, we don't see cars, I'm oh, sorry, we don't see, you know, buildings, uh, uh, we don't see a lot of new construction going on in uh, Montpelier, and so, uh, being able to address um, our current built infrastructure is really important. If we're going to meet or reach our net zero energy goals, there's no way to do that without addressing existing buildings. What was the, you may have said this during your presentation, I apologize. Um, what was the vote on this? Um, it was actually 51%. It was very close. Rob? Um, I, I got a couple questions. One, I'm, I'm going to sort of act with my friends. Uh, concerns to my oh, I'm your friend today. <laughs> today. You know, to, to me, the process is kind of backwards, and I'm going to make the analogy here with your public safety authority. Um, I was part of that discussion early on, and I felt that you needed to go through and flush out some more things than were done before people went ahead and got hooked onto that public safety authority. And I'm going to say my prediction was true. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent on that thing, and it has gone nowhere. I look at this as the same way here. You're asking for a blank check to go through and have these robust discussions after the fact. And my preference would certainly be is you have those robust discussions before, because I'm one of those landlords that own multi-family buildings. But I will say I make a point not to buy anything in Montpelier, because Montpelier is very challenging. Um, very, very challenging. I pay my heat, my tenants' heat, but this to me is just when, you, when you're going to go through and now interject yourself into my closing on a property, um, I, I have some major, major concerns over that. And as you said, Montpelier 
has not had a lot of development. You might take a look in the glass and say, why haven't we had a lot of development? You have a lot of old housing stock. Vermont has a lot of old housing stock. Multifamily using units are all old housing stock. And it is very expensive, even without somebody looking over your shoulder to go through and make the upgrades that you have to make. So I have some major concerns over this. Um, normally I'm a local control person, but I think this is absolutely an overreach, personally. Yes. I also own apartments, and, uh, and I pay both the heat and the lights, electricity for those units. And it's more so because most of the tenants today have a very difficult time paying for heat or lights and rent because they make choices. Mm -hmm. So this way here, they only have to come up with one type of payment. Yeah. But, the, but at the same time, I find it challenging to maintain a place like that. I've done all new windows, I've done insulation, all new doors, and the barrier wood house probably built in the 20s. But the catch I see is that right next to me is somebody else who owns a duplex who has a very much challenge of meeting his own bills while he's running there. How is he going to, I know you talked about having others come in, but I continue to see the regulations change for how you, as a renter, can rent property. Uh, so you as an owner has more and more challenges all the time where the renters are getting more and more assistance or other things to help them through this process. If you do not help those other owners of property in some way, they're not going to spend that kind of money. I think I put $90,000 in a four apartment house to try and get the energy up. It's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing is, is how do you get people to do things like that? I don't see it easily and I don't see it by coming in and passing an ordinance that says all of a sudden you have to do X and most landlords won't even know it because they do live out of town, a lot of them. And all of a sudden they're receiving these uh, regulations. What you find in the is they'll be selling and they'll try to sell to someone that's a residence as well and you'll end up with another bigger problem. Now you're going to have more places to assist or places that won't be rented at all and they'll see, you'll see signs out where, you know, they're left, they're empty. So that would be um, actually a remarkable thing for us because Montpelier has um, a less than 1% vacancy rate right now. So this is absolutely a seller's uh, market and we, uh, uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, arguably absolutely the right time to be doing this sort of thing because um, properties in Montpelier are uh, really hard to come by. The same in my town, I, I yeah. see the selling. Mm -hmm. But the problem is I had, and my town's rural, very few in it, uh, but uh, most of the people that buy in are out of state. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the catch that I see is uh, the challenge is how do you work with all parties? Sure. That's the key. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so uh, for the folks who that you described who are of low income, they have lots of assistance, um, and even um, even if they don't own the property, there's still assistance available for for them. Um, for the next uh, sort of tier up, there are other assistance programs that are available, and I think um, Efficiency Vermont has um, programs for them as well. So part of uh, the intent with our discussion is to find like how do we appropriately assist everyone on the on the spectrum. I guess I need a better understanding of how you would put this into practice. So. Would a home just be audited when it's getting ready to be sold, or? So actually, I'm going to um, defer that answer to Richard, okay. if I may. Yeah. Can I? If I, if I Absolutely. May. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a little bit of of um, uh, clarification that would be helpful too. I think we're talking about two market sectors here. Your question was primarily, as I understand it, focused on single family homeowners. Residential. And residential homeowners and, and the disclosure component of this, what we've been talking about previously is, is um, energy standards for rental property. So I, I think you know, so there's sort of two, two sectors out there that, that this would potentially address. Um, on the single family uh, sales side, right now there's no standardized way of informing the subsequent buyer of what the energy use of that home would be. And, and, um, uh, right now, you can you can provide past 
energy bills, but if you have a large family that's moved out and a small family that's moving in, or you have different weather from one year to the next, or somebody sets their thermostat at a different, at a different point, there's no standardized way of, of assessing the, the asset, as we call it in the, in the business. So it's, um, you know, it has some standardized way of, of ensuring that there's a, 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 a way of looking at buildings across different um, ownership um, um, families that move in there. So the, the model that, we're, uh, that we've been looking at, Efficiency of Vermont has been putting together, is based on one that's available, it's, it's rated millions of homes in the, in the U.S. as part of one of the um, uh, online realtor portals. Um, and it's simply that the seller or the realtor can put in the, the age of the home, the heating system type, um, the size of the home and some, some other features uh, with, without uh, having to hire an independent person uh, for a cost that might delay um, and come up with a standardized uh, measure of, of that home's um, uh, energy usage that would then be conveyed to the buyer so they have some idea of, of what's there. If they, had, if they had done some additional improvements to that home, done a home performance um, a weatherization job or put in a new heating system, they can fine tune that in, in the model and, and come up with that information as well. So this process, um, Efficiency Vermont is developing these tools right now, would work with the, the Realtor Association and, and others, uh, and, and phase this in over time as well too, do the training and provide those resources. So that standardized dollars per year, what it's gonna cost for somebody when they're buying a house, they have that information up front um, as they're looking at homes. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Now, on the other side of it that you mentioned, the rental, how would that be different? Uh, well, presumably, the, the rental could have, uh, could use that same information. Uh, the presumption as well, too, it, looking at what Burlington has done, uh, they have some minimum energy standards that buildings would need to meet when they change, they, they change hands. Uh, in Burlington's case, it's when the properties are sold. And that's one of the potential triggers that, that could Montpelier could look at. Of course, this is going to be part of the conversation that, that Paul mentioned, that the discussion with, with property owners and others in town, how that would actually work. Um, the way it works in Burlington, if you have walls that are uninsulated, believe it or not, there's still a lot of buildings in Burlington that don't have insulation walls. That those would need to be filled with insulation. If you've got single pane windows, you need to put a storm window on it. So there's some sort of minimum standards uh, and and in, in Burlington as well, they have Vermont Gas Systems serves most of those customers, and so they have programs for subsidized heating systems and incentives for uh, and for improving the efficiency of the heating systems and hot water systems and those as well too. But only at the time of sale. That's just at the time of sale. Yes, in Burlington. Nelson. What about change of occupancy? Because that's where it comes into rentals. I know they do mm -hmm. times of sales. What you do with private? What about change of occupancy? Is that when you go in and check each time there was somebody leaving? You want to address that? Um, not not necessarily. Um, we uh, we could, but I I um, it just depends on how we set it up. Do you have an occupancy permit now in Alpilia mm -hmm. where a person can't change? If a renter moves out before somebody can move in, you have to check the property, give them an occupancy permit. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You don't. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, no. okay. Good question. Rob? Um, well, to go back to the multi, the multi-family units, uh, I find it hard to believe that there would be anybody out there that would consider buying a unit that doesn't go through and do a cash flow analysis and you pin down exactly what your utility costs are, you know, your your income versus loss. So I mean, to me, you're you're already trying to, you know, that's redundant. And again, I'll express my concern is that you're trying to interject yourself into a process here very late in the process because if I've got the property listed so you're telling me that I have to go through and have this energy audit done and have all the recommendations that they're claiming need to be addressed addressed before I can sell my property if I own one in Montpelier is that the position you'd be taking I believe that's uh, similar to what's done in Burlington right now um, though there is a cap on the amount of money that would be um, the, the property owner or seller would be required to spend. What would that cap be? Um, I don't know what Burlington's cap is. I think it's something like fifteen hundred dollars a unit. It's, it's pretty minimal. It might it might be a couple thousand. They're looking at adjusting that. I don't know exactly. Yeah. 
So if you've got a four unit, you're talking anywhere from six to eight thousand dollars that you have to invest in that property before you can sell it. Sure. Sure. Okay. Great for somebody that doesn't have to pay that bill. Which won't come close to really energizing that building, six or eight thousand uh, dollars. Windows alone, for what you're talking about, a poor apartment, will go way beyond the exceed that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my concern that I'm hearing is you want to do something that's energy efficient and make sure these places meet those requirements. But I know from past practice that there's a significant cost to do that mm -hmm. to an older building. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if you're really planning to do this to gain, you have to look at it in a much bigger picture is the way I would look at it to meet that because if you do this touch the thing, you really haven't accomplished anything at all where you think you're going. Well, so I would make the case that we are trying to think about this in a big picture <laughs> way, um, trying to have um, you know the authority to do some regulations around this. Um, we'd also, I mean, we, we know that incentives alone um, are not sufficient um, to make uh, people uh, make the, the choices uh, towards energy efficiency that we know need to happen in order for us to meet our own goals. And so uh, if we, uh, actually it's interesting, if you look at the, the data from up here, even for this year, uh, because we've had this conversation as a community, uh, we have we've not implemented any regulations uh, at all at this point. But even just by having the conversation, the number of energy efficiency uh, projects that have been done and are being tracked through Efficiency Vermont is already um, greater than the totals for the previous years. One, one more, thing. as we know, the population in our state is old, older than there's very few young people. Most people that are doing these investments, uh, you know, I just did an investment in my own ho home. I know that I will not recover. I put in the mm -hmm. heat pump, things, even though I have a very efficient furnace in the new home. I will not be around when I get back the money that I put into that. I did it because I want to make sure for the future of people. But the bottom line is, you know, there's people out there that just, I just don't see how everybody's going to be able to afford this. This is where I come from. It's going to be hard for people who are in fixed incomes, that are elderly, living in a home that they own, to meet the requirements to really improve the efficiency of a house. That's that's my concern. How yeah. do we? And if we force people into that, what we really do is force them into worrying about how they're living, whether they're going to buy food or whether they're going to pay for efficiency or something else. And I think we're doing the wrong thing if we do that. We shouldn't be putting pressure on people in areas that we know they can't meet. And again, I'll just repeat that we have, uh, we're planning on building in some supports, particularly, especially for that type of situation. And I, I want to thank you for doing uh, the right thing with your property. That's awesome. I would also observe that um, from an economics point of view, it's, it's also, uh, it was not necessarily a financial decision. It was a, de a decision about um, what's right for the universe uh, and right, yeah. you know, for, for humanity. And we, um, you know, we need more people like you. And if, if everybody was behaving like you, then, um, uh, then we wouldn't be in this situation, um, but uh, but we know that we are, and there not everybody is making that same choice, unfortunately. Usually, when people sell a property, they fix it up a little bit before it goes on the market, and you build those costs into the selling price of that property. So, if you have added energy efficiency to that house, that I would think it would make it more valuable and therefore you up the price and you recoup your money back. Yep. But that's my yep. limited knowledge of real estate. Mm -hmm. Rob? As somebody who's done a lot of real estate, that is not always the case. Okay. You can put a brand new roof on a property and it doesn't necessarily enhance the value because people are walking in there buying that place expecting they're gonna have a roof that does not leak or a septic system that works. You could put in a brand new septic system. Energy efficiency, um, it, it does not necessarily add. It might drive down your annual cost if you have it long enough. That can, that can help to factor, but um, I'll still go back to, we have a lot of old housing stock and you want to talk about doing the right things. I mean, when you spend $15,000 on rehabbing one apartment, um, it takes a long time to get that cost back, and you may not ever get it back. Um, so, no, it does not always equate a dollar spent as a dollar return. Okay. 
by any means. So we actually have data on that, um, and I'm going to refer to um, Richard. Oh. Well, I was going to respond. To okay. <laughs> this is exactly why we're trying to do this: is to is to make is leverage the power of markets. Right now, this information on energy consumption is not out there in every transaction and home sale. If it is, people will start valuing it. They'll, they'll, the appraisers will have that information in front of them. There's a, there'll be a standardized way. As people look for properties, they'll know to look for that information. So we're trying to leverage the power of markets through transparency, trying, trying to have a, a way to, to put this information in front of people so that it, they can value energy. Because right now, the markets are broken, and, and, and they, people aren't valuing it. So information is, is the key to, to one of the components we're trying to put in place here. Uh, yeah, just to follow up, um, uh, there is uh, data out there in places that have implemented um, uh, energy efficiency labeling, and um, it does show um, in a uh, positive impact on uh, sale of homes. Yeah. I, would love to, I would love to see those sources. Yeah, and, during, and time on the market too. Yes. Cool. You get that. So I agree. Information is very helpful. I, if I buy an appliance, I look at that energy guide. Uh, it's new appliances. When I look, when I buy a car, I've been influenced. Everything else being equal by the miles per gallon, um, <clears throat> but that's a transaction or a purchase decision. What you're proposing here is to pass an ordinance that may put everyone who's in an existing home or commercial storefront. Um, you know, you could have a, a representative of Kitzmiller's old store. Um, probably big single pane picture windows. Um, we're uh, 74 I, that were all exactly the same size. Yeah. <laughs> and it took a, sort of a three year plan to replace all of them. But, but had you not replaced them, this would have said, by the way, you got to have double pane, triple pane, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, and it's going to cost you, you know, $30,000, uh, whatever. Uh, to do that. Um, we're not talking about when he sells that real estate, we're talking about existing. You could be in a home that you're going to be planned to be in for the next 50 years. Um, you've got to upgrade it um, because you passed a new ordinance. So uh, this is pretty broad. This is not the language that was uh, approved by the voters on a very close vote. Um, this is going to require, from my perspective, a little bit more conversation. Well, I don't. I guess one thing I would like to see if we agree on is that there are market barriers out there to helping the state achieve its 90% by 2050. You know, split incentive is not something we made up. It's not something unique to Montpelier. It's all across the country in terms of why property owners who don't pay the heating bill don't invest in proving efficiency. It's not. It's not like, you know, some of those, like, I don't know the representative here, but do the right thing. What we're trying to do is go after the folks who aren't doing the right thing, aren't moving this target. So it's like, let's, let's agree that, yes, there's a, there's a need for regulation. As much as we don't, a lot of us don't like regulation, things that the market alone aren't going to get us there. And all we're asking for is the broad authority that will then have a conversation property owners, renters across the board, in terms of what makes sense for Montpelier. That's what we're asking for. Um, you know, I agree with all the disclosure. I think that's very valuable. But when I hear the word, we're going to go after people, it, it really concerns me. Um, because I think, you know, the first step is really getting the disclosure out there um, and making sure that people understand how energy efficient their apartment is that they're renting or how ener energy efficient the house or condo they're purchasing is. That I see as, as a great first step and to see how that will influence people's decisions to purchase um, or rent. But it's the second part um, when people get penalized that I do have some concerns around. So I think it would be helpful at this point if we asked Tucker to join us and to go through the actual words that, uh, that we have settled upon after a little bit of refinement. Do you have uh, do you have that so that you can pull it up? It's it's in the uh, Montpelier document. It's just okay. There. So let's uh, let's go back to the document. Okay. Tucker, you can help put up put this in context for us so that we understand how this how this exists relative to um, 
Put pressure on it. Okay. That's the original, right? Yes, this is the original. Let's see. Sure. Good morning, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. Taking a look at the uh, suggested amendment to H547 that Montpelier has brought this morning. Um, first, it would add the term regulation to what was presented to the voters. That would allow ordinances to be adopted in this specific instance that uh, are in addition to those energy efficiency standards that are outlined in general law. And we'll come back to that at the end of this amendment. Um, the clause at the end here states that the city's energy efficiency standards shall be at least as strict as the standards set by 30 VSA Chapter 2. That is the chapter in Title 30 that sets the statewide energy efficiency standards. Um, there are provisions in Chapter 2 that allow for local enforcement of those statewide energy efficiency standards. And most importantly, they uh, allow a municipality to enforce them through their issuance of a certificate of occupancy or a plumbing or electrical permit, which is the basis for the city of Burlington's ordinance that was discussed earlier. And an important note that should be thrown out and further discussed, perhaps when you come back to this, uh, is the capacity for any level of government to interfere with the sale of property. That has come up quite a bit this morning, that somehow property would not be allowed to be sold unless it met certain standards. The standards may very well affect the value of the sale, but to intervene in the transaction of property would likely constitute a governmental taking. Now, how does state law address this very specific issue? How do we get to the top here? Well, in that chapter, there is a subsection added into, am I even in the right chapter? Can I want to help you? Uh, <laughs> please. I'm not going to. Uh, that you've seen quite a bit in this committee um, that has been discussed quite a bit and that you added to H-526 when discussing the survey plats. This subsection I, title validity not affected. A defect in marketable title shall not be created by a failure to issue certification or a certificate as required under subsection F, subdivision H-4 of this section. This is for the disclosures. This is stating that as these energy efficiency standards are being measured and enforced, that the title to the property is not going to be affected by the rating or by the enforcement done by the municipality. The buyer may have leverage in the city of Burlington to say this property is not as valuable as you are asserting because it is not meeting the city standards, but the city is likely not going to be able to say you can't sell this home because it's not meeting our standards. Uh, also a note to throw in this discussion that came from the Senate on your committee bill, H-526, uh, on the floor, there was discussion about the city of Burlington's energy efficiency standards, and the president pro tem shared a story that he had to replace a broken window, and that window was installed before some of the new energy efficiency standards, and when he replaced it, he had to record on the title for his home that the new window met the city's energy efficiency standards, and he had to pay the, the city recording fees that were just increased by this committee. So there is a more robust and complicated. Say that, Mr. Pro Tem. Yes. <laughs> there is a, a bit more of a uh, robust discussion around these issues. Um, to cover very quickly, as I scratch your iPad, um, I'm not even sure where this is anymore. Uh, some of the differences here between 
the authority that would be delegated to the city of Montpelier and what lies in general state law. Uh, really, it's here regulating the disclosure requirements, which Ellen uh, Tchaikowski from Legislative Council may be able to more articulately and delicately explain. But as far as I know, uh, those are optional at this point. So there could be um, authority here to make them mandatory. And the second, uh, the existing properties, which has been part of the in-depth discussion this morning. Questions for Tucker or for Alan on energy efficiency? Okay. Thank you very much for the rapid walkthrough of um, the language. Um, so committee, we have floor bells ringing. We will come back to committee right after floor. We have um, S134 uh, right after the floor, and we have charter committee discussion for tomorrow morning. So go forth and do good work.